back, everybody. I hope you all had a good lunch. Um, we're gonna, we added something in since we're going through these more quickly than, than we realized. As I said, this is my first time doing this training, so I honestly didn't know how long it would take to get through the modules. Um, and we weren't originally going to talk about this, but um, we thought it would be a good idea to throw it in because um, before lunch, I was talking about methods of compensatory mitigation and then, now this is the mechanisms. So, I guess I have the clicker, don't I? So, there are three common mechanisms for conducting compensatory mitigation. The first one, um, there's permittee responsible, and then there's banks, um, originally mitigation banks, but now additional types of banks, and then something called an in-lieu fee arrangement. And there are some terms that are used for accounting. A credit is a unit based on the increase in functions or acreage associated with the restoration project. So um, you do some kind of project and it creates ecological credits. And these pertain to um, banks and in-lieu fees primarily. They're not typically used in permittee responsible that I know of, I could be wrong. Um, so debit is the other side of that. Um, if you've got a bank that has accrued credits through their restoration action, then they can trade or sell those credits and they are debited from the bank. And then finally, there's a service area, which is the geographic area within which a bank or an in lieu fee program can operate. And so here's an example of a service area um, that's the Pacific Ocean, so I think it's probably California, um, of some place called uh, Burdell Ranch. And that red dotted line is the area in which they can sell credits. So an impact within that red area can be compensated for by buying credits at the Burdell Ranch Bank, which is that gray square. So, but let's start with permittee responsible. Um, and that is basically when you're the developer or the project proponent, you also do the compensation or you hire a consultant or a contractor to do the compensation. Um, it can be located adjacent to the site or another location. Generally, if you're using the watershed approach within the same watershed or if you're an estuarine or marine within some appropriate um, geographic or biogeographical unit. And um, if you're working under the Clean Water Act, there are specific requirements in that for siting monitoring and, and everything. In this case, so this is basically the, the timeline um, under, which, under which it works. The permittee is required to do compensatory mitigation. The permittee is responsible for monitoring it. The permittee is responsible for its long-term management, and the permittee is responsible for its ultimate success. One of the reasons that mitigation banking got started is because a lot of developers didn't want that responsibility. You know, they're good at building office buildings. They didn't want to have to multitask and also be good at building and maintaining um, aquatic resources. And so um, here's an example of a permittee responsible site, the Tampa Port Authority expansion project, where they were filling 63 acres of estuarine open wadded and unvegetated subtidal habitats, and they will be doing wetland creation and enhancement of a larger amount of habitat in that area. So then we had banking come along. The first banks um, were started in the 1980s, and they were actually um, a way for departments of transportation to kind of get ahead of their compensation requirements. Departments of transportation build a lot of linear projects that if it crosses a wetland has a small impact. And if they had to do compensation every time they crossed wetland, they'd be doing a lot of little tiny um, compensation projects all over the landscape. And so they started doing that compensation kind of ahead of time um, and only for themselves. They didn't sell credits to anybody else. And, um, but that idea caught on 
And so basically what banking is now is it's this consolidated compensation site that where the credits are hopefully produced in advance. Um, they are operated usually by profit, uh, for profit by private entities, uh, a lot of times relying on private investment to get started. I used to think that the companies here put up their own money to build banks, but they'll often go to financers and say, hey, I want to build a bank. I can give you a 6% return on your investment. Give me a couple million dollars or however much, probably more than a million. Um, there are a lot of standards that these banks need to meet um, to be used for 404 impacts under the 2008 Clean Water Act rule. Um, all kinds of, they need to achieve certain milestones before you sell the credits. So um, you do a restoration site, you put some plants in the ground, and you don't get to sell the credits that would be associated with a fully um, mature site. You know, if your vegetation is only 10% grown, then you only sell 10% of the credits. And the idea is that you're not selling anything that isn't already in the ground. So the idea of a mitigation bank, which is the term used for Clean Water Act banks, started being used in the Endangered Species Act realm. And so those are called conservation banks. And I am, I know there are conservation banks throughout the country for the Fish and Wildlife Service. For NOAA, we only have them on the West Coast right now, but there's one being developed um, for the sawtooth. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we'll be seeing one on the East Coast soon. And then this concept started being adopted by people working under NERDA. And um, so providing compensation for impacts regulated under the Oil Pollution Act um, or Superfund. So with a bank, you need to get regulatory approval through either the core or um, NIMFS if you're doing a conservation or restoration bank. Um, the bank is responsible for monitoring, the bank is responsible for long-term management, and the bank is responsible for ultimate success. And so that's a big load off the um, people building office buildings. I forget what date this is from. It probably doesn't matter because there are lots of banks, which is pretty much what that slide says. Um, and as you might expect, they're concentrated in areas with high develop, development because one of the first things that happened when um, banking got off the ground is people would say, I've got this great piece of farmed wetland. I'm going to restore it and use it as a mitigation bank. And the problem was they were in the middle of nowhere, and so there was nobody developing wetlands, and so there was no market for their credits. And that's why under the 2008 rule, if you want to start a mitigation bank, part of what you need to submit to the core is a market analysis. So this is an example of a bank in New Jersey, Lakes Creek. And this is a combination of enhancement, creation, and, pres and uh, preservation. And um, I've got an asterisk next to enhancement because they call it enhancement, but from what I saw of what they're actually doing, it's restoration rehabilitation. But they're calling it enhancement, and that's fine. It's getting done. That's the point. Here is an example of a conservation bank. So this is a bank that is chaired by NOAA National Marine Fisheries Service. It was established in 2010. And it provides credits for, um, for salmon uh, species in that area. And they're based on the habitat. So there are, so, so if you're impact, so they're matching impacts. So we've got seasonally inundated floodplains um, through a whole bunch of different habitats that the fish use. And then this is a restoration bank, Alder Creek in Oregon, I believe, um, developed by 
one of the companies that's very active in mitigation banking, Wildlands Incorporated, um, former lumber mill, and it's 52 acres of um, restoring buildings, infrastructure, rescaping the riverbanks, and creating wetland habitat. And so this project, the credits are being purchased by entities who are liable for, um, for chemical pollution and a whole bunch of stuff that's going on in, uh, in Portland Harbor. So, three different kinds of banks wasn't good enough. Now we have combination banks because, again, it gets back to that market thing. So if you can sell credits to someone who needs a 404 permit and sell credits to someone who has an Endangered Species Act compensation obligation, then you've got a bigger market. And so this is fine. Um, we do have this um, requirement that you can't sell the same piece of the restoration twice. So if you have a bank that's providing 404 credits and ESA credits, once you've sold the credit, it's gone. So if someone has a 404 responsibility and they buy that acre or whatever, um, someone who has an ESA responsibility can't come in and say, I want to buy that unsold ESA credit. Once it's gone, it's gone, whether it's being used for one or both or multiple compensation requirements. Linton Mill is a joint bank that is being used to offset NERDA impacts as well as Section 404 impacts and um, also Oregon Department of State lands impacts. All right, in-lieu fees. In-lieu fees are like banks in that they are a, cons a way to consolidate compensation for impacts. They are generally administered by state governments, local governments, or nonprofits. And they rely on fees paid to them to fund their compensation. So unlike a bank where the restoration is done up front, with in-lieu fee programs, the restoration is done only after they've collected enough money to do a decent sized project. So in this case, again, the, um, the developer is, transfers their liability to the in-lieu fee program operator. And the in-lieu fee is responsible for the long-term management and ultimately for its success. So <laughs> I just love Massachusetts. Um, one of the best Massachusetts uh, one of the best in lieu fee programs is operated by the state of Massachusetts. Um, they do um, compensation for core 404 permits, and they have um, a bunch of different, they have the state divided into different service areas, and they collect money from people who are required to do compensation, and then they put out an RFP, a request. Uh, I've used the old one, I don't remember. Thank you. Now we use NOFO, um, but that's a different story. Um, but anyway, so they will then solicit um, uh, bids from people who want to do this restoration work. And so they don't do the restoration work themselves, but they are still on the hook um, in terms of liability. Virginia has um, an in fee program. Well, they have a couple. This particular one, um, is called the Aquatic Trust Fund. And this is the one run by Nature Conservancy, right? Yeah. And so they, again, are, are consolidating money for many projects. And this one has um, authorized over $60 million to pursue 134 mitigation projects in the in lieu fee. Okay. Any questions? Just a point of clarification, when, when you refer to the contractor and the ILF, uh, 
who to whom is the contract responsible to? I assume it's the ILF program. But so um, I was referring, I think probably. To, well, yeah, I should be more precise in my terminology. Um, so in an in lieu fee um, process, so you you have a developer who has a, a compensation requirement. They pay money to the in lieu fee program. And that is the amount of money that is that would be required to do a compensation project for that amount of impact. So it's not just a random amount of money. And then the in lieu fee program, like Massachusetts Department of Fish and Game, will hire a contractor to go out and do the restoration. And it might not be a contractor. It might be um, an NGO. Or, or, I mean, anybody who can, achieve, who can achieve the required compensation would be eligible to get that money. One of the reasons that only state or government entities or NGOs are allowed to run these programs is because there's a lot of opportunity for misuse of the funds. <laughs> you know, you collect a bunch of money and say, yeah, I'm going to go off and restore a bunch of wetlands, and then you don't. So um, it was thought that by requiring it to be uh, an, uh, either a nonprofit or a government entity, there would be more accountability. And then um, I got some questions um, on the, during the break that, uh, about something called advance mitigation. Um, we are currently looking at that. It's not covered in our procedures because it wasn't an issue when we finalized the procedures, but we'll be updating our procedures to include that as a mechanism as well. And that is kind of, we were, we were talking about it as an in lieu fee, or is it permittee responsible, is it a bank? That's an arrangement where, similar to the, the DOTs I talked about originally, um, an entity, say a port, knows that it's going to have a lot of compensation requirements in the future. And they know there's a restoration project that they can do now. Um, in the specific case I'm thinking of, it's removing creosote pilings from the harbor. And rather than going out and receive and removing enough pilings to compensate for each individual impact over time, they want to just go out and remove them all and then have that compensation credit be available to them in the future. So again, it's similar to what the DOTs were doing in that it's a single user bank arrangement, um, or you could, or what we most people have been calling it is it's advanced mitigation for a permittee. So it's permittee responsible advanced mitigation. The, the point is that they're not selling credits anywhere. They're, gen they're generating ecological credits by doing a big restoration project, but they're not selling them. They're using them themselves as needed. Yes? I'm curious on where the conversation is going with that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm curious on where the conversation is going with that, because I know at one point that issue was raised with uh, somebody who did compensation for a project that had already been permitted. The project no longer ended up happening, but they had this compensation in the ground and they wanted to use it for a different project. Um, is that outside of the scope of advanced um, compensation that, that you've just talked about? And then um, I guess the, the other question is, how does that fit in with the ESA mandates where they can have um, net gain? Mm -hmm. And so is that something where you just say, well, I'm sorry, you compensated for it. That was net gain. You Good still for have the species. To, you have to, great for the species. <laughs> now you have to compensate for this next impact because that was already permitted. That was for that permit that happened that you never did. Right. So I'm wondering um, what the thinking has been on, on that sort so of So on that specific project, I have not heard anything on that for a while. We can ask about it at the conference, because I know the people involved in that are, are going to be here. 
Um, but yeah, that's, that's an interesting situation where um, you, you create, you know, you restore an area in anticipation of needing that compensation and then your project doesn't get permitted. So, you know, what is that actually? Um, I would think that, um, I mean, we're bureaucrats, we can come up with a, a form for pretty much anything. I'm sure there's a way to transfer those credits to another project or, I don't know. What do you think, Army Corps? Have you ever run into that? Not, not in particular. We haven't, uh, not in uh, Jacksonville District, I don't believe we've had that issue, but if there ever was a situation like that, just like you're saying, we could find a way to yeah. go back in, you know, do the, the effects analysis and just provide it in right. um, to, to whatever entity needed to use it. Um, I think here in the state of Florida, we've had DOT banks um, that are just sole users and that's all they did. Mm -hmm. And I was going to ask you the question more along the lines of what's the difference between the advanced advanced mitigation and a uh, single user mitigation bank? I think the major difference is um, they're not, it, the IRT is probably okay. part of it. Okay. Um, you know, because you're not selling credits. So um, there's, so the effect of the transaction is more like permittee responsible mitigation because it's, it's the same person. I mean, you still need to do that coordination with the agencies, but it's a little bit of different kind of coordination. Right. Thank you. And to answer Catherine's second question, um, we're working on advance mitigation language for the procedures right now. Um, our West Coast region has been begging for it. And um, so we are using some of the templates already out there. There's, um, there's a district, I think it's in the Southeast, that has um, their own advanced mitigation guidance. Uh, the state of Washington has advanced mitigation guidance. And so we're going to be pulling from those documents and putting together an additional chapter in the procedures. Yes? More comment than a question. It sounds like what you're describing uh, north of the border is what we would what we would refer to as proponent-led habitat banking. So it's a proponent that's anticipating mitigate future needs uh -huh. and does its own habitat banking uh, yes. Uh, to so to be proactive, and the best example I can think of, because um, there, there aren't many that I'm that we're aware of, is the uh, Vancouver Fraser Port Authority has done advanced mitigation. I'd call them habitat banks for its for its permittees, uh -huh. and, it's an, and they have an MOU with the Department of Fisheries so that there's advanced agreement as to what those habitats represent. Oh, wow. yeah. This would be a fun example of the U.S. learning from Canada if I could get a copy oh. of that agreement. <laughs> God help us. Um, <laughs> all I'll say to that effect is that uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service, amongst other things under its evolving environmental and mitigation framework, is developing guidance for great. proponents who are thinking about those sorts of things. Awesome. Um, that sounds great. I guess kind of a comment to add on to that. Um, here in the States, or Washington at least, uh, advanced mitigation, like the permitting process, is a little bit different than a mitigation bank process. Like the port has both. We have advanced mitigation sites developed under the advanced mitigation guidance, and we have a mitigation bank developed under the mitigation bank IRT guidance. So it's kind of two different processes. One takes eight to 10 years, one takes <laughs> about a year and a half. Yeah, and, and that's, I mean, all these questions about, you know, what is it? Is it, is it a bank? Is it project re permittee responsible? Um, I think as we're developing our addition to the procedures, we're gonna have to make those distinctions very clear. All right, thanks. All right, well, we're gonna close out this session with um, uh, talking about climate change and compensation in dynamic environments. And I'd have to say that um
this um, topic as like the landscape seascape topic is one where we've got more ideas than answers. Um, we know, I mean, we know we want to be incorporating climate change into our mitigation decisions. We have some ideas on how to do that, but we're looking for other ideas. And um, I expect that our approach to this will be evolving, not only with uh, climate science, but just with our on the ground application of it. Okay, so I guess now that climate change isn't a dirty word, let's talk about it. So climate change adversely affects NOAA trust resources uh, throughout the range. So for example, you know, sea level rise impacts tidal marshes, uh, continual record breaking temperatures alter foraging and spawning habitat for fish or even available habitat in the polar regions. And there's a risk of ocean acidification that can degrade or impair calcium carbonate structures such as coral and oyster reefs. So um, as NOAA was developing their uh, mitigation policy and procedures that it was asked a number of climate related questions. So there's a lot of uncertainty associated with climate change. You know, how do we factor into um, our mitigation decisions? You know, how do we design you know, mitigation projects that are durable and resilient? And how do we think about compensation for adverse impacts to sites that will be negatively affected by climate change? So for example, you know, projected sea level rise and land erosion. So as we think about climate change and mitigation, keep in mind that climate change can be integrated into just not, not just compensation, but throughout the entire mitigation sequence that includes both avoidance and minimization, as well, obviously, compensation. So the NOAA mitigation policy states that we will consider climate change and climate resilience when, eval when evaluating and developing mitigation measures. So the policy goes on to, to state that NOAA will consider how climate change may influence the effectiveness and resilience of mitigation. That is important to design mitigation that is durable, adaptable, and resilient. And then when incorporating climate change into mitigation, into mitigation decisions, we will rely on specific statutory requirements for the best available science. Okay, so here is kind of a uh, an example using the Kensington Gold Mine Dam as a case study. So this dam holds uh, liquid mine waste and the project proposed expanding the mine which would require alterations to the dam and these alterations would increase the amount of liquid waste produced. However, the proposed projects did not take into account climate change, specifically the pre uh, predicted models for increased precipitation. This would result in a higher than originally anticipated uh, volume of liquid. So uh, because these didn't take these into consideration, NIMS came in and recommended that they increase their dam from, I guess, a 30, like around 30 foot increase to about 120 foot increase to incorporate uh, such increase in liquid volume because as proposed, it, it uh, significantly increased the probability that the dam would fail and if this would happen, then you'd have several toxic pollutants running off and contaminating adjacent waterways and available EFH, which is never a good thing. So another example is uh, to, that kind of originally failed to um, consider climate change is uh, in Maine, it's the Micaiah's Dyke Bridge which was in a fairly degraded state and the project just proposed restoring um, this dike to near identical replacement except for having larger culverts. Uh, this uh, project proposed to have a life of about, about 75 years. However, it didn't take climate change into consideration, specifically sea level rise, storm surges, and flooding. So NIMS recommended an alternative design to uh, not only increase the function of the dike with, uh, with the increased rainfall projections, but also incorporate fish passages. <laughs> 
So climate change is addressed in two sections, section F, and then also in section G talks about uh, compensation for dynamic environments, which is highly related to climate change. So section F addresses not just looking at individual projections or effects, but taking synergistic effects into account, as well as the IPCC pathways. That's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So I want to note that the different uh, authorities require different IPCC pathways. Uh, the procedure also addresses taking into account the time frame for which mitigation should persist. So climate change um, interjects some level of uncertainty with respect to changing environments and habitats. So developing an adaptive management plan is absolutely key. And you know, I also want to note that climate change is uh, based on predictive models that rise from the currently best available data. So when adaptive management plans are developed on the current best available science, they should be updated as science and models are constantly evolving as new data is collected. So this is just uh, an example that I came across from a publication in 2015 that looked at infrastructure um, in respects to climate change. And this is a map of the Tampa area where they looked at, if you just look at sea level rise, this is specifically to housing, that the areas that would uh, recommend to be abandoned is colored in red. However, when you look at the synergistic effects of sea level rise with storm surge, you can see that the areas that would have to go under abandonment are substantially increased. So taking, in fact, these uh, synergistic um, relationships are critical or essential. So the NOAA mitigation policy lets individual programs decide which pathway is best. Um, is the best option for use when evaluating mitigation. Um, however, this is dependent on which authority uh, you're working under. So currently, the ESA evaluates using um, an RCP of 8.5, that is what's considered the most risk adverse in these models. However, if uh, with EFH, the range can be about 4.5 and 8.5, where 4.5 is considered the most plausible outcome. Okay, another example is the, and if I pronounce this wrong, <laughs> please uh, correct me, but the Nuyakuk uh, River hydropower, uh, hydropower Project. Um, so the initial design uh, failed to consider projections of increased uh, precipitation, which would affect both power production and the riverine environment. So NIMS recommended that the project design consider climate change and projected future flows to avoid adverse, adverse effects to the Bristol Bay salmon and other trust resources. So the procedure also talks about taking into account near-term effects. So this is in situations where climate change is, recurring, is occurring rapidly. Um, so you have areas that uh, that where changes are occurring so rapidly that restored low salt marsh um, will become degraded in a short period of time. So it's not just taking a look of future projections, but also current sur uh, storm surges that are happening. So adaptive management plans has been mentioned a few times. Um, throughout this presentation, but what exactly do we mean by having, an, uh, by having and developing an adaptive management plan? So here is an example uh, with salt marsh. So if the proposed project is to restore marsh habitat, the idea is to consider sea level rise and develop a plan that identifies and maps salt marsh migration and removing any barriers that may prevent future migration. So there has been some interest in accounting for blue carbon sequestration in storage and storage and mitigation decision. However, exactly how this would be done and how we would quantify um, this is still being developed. <laughs> 
So the procedures also contain a section for compensation in dynamic environments. Compensatory mitigation in these environments can be difficult. Uh, this can result in the tendency to avoid restoration or other compensation uh, actions in these dynamic environments. However, uh, these environments are very important to NOAA and NOAA's trust resources, so uh, compensating uh, for full impacts to these environments means considering working in these transitory uh, environments. So when working um, in dynamic environments, it's important to develop the adaptive management plan uh, to take into consideration that sites can transition so for example, high tidal marsh can become low tidal marsh and, uh, as a result of sea level rise. Uh, this can also come into consideration during compensatory mitigation and you can consider combining in-kind and out-of-kind compensation. So for example, if there are impacts to low, uh, low tidal salt marsh, you can propose uh, doing some offsets with restoring low tidal marsh as well as uh, possibly developing some uh, breakwater oyster reefs to help reduce coastal erosion. Okay, so as many of you probably know, the Louisiana coastline is highly dynamic and is susceptible to subsidence. So in 1984, the Fino Terre Bank was established and it was proposed to have a life of about 77 years. But due to projected loss, uh, the sponsor could not commit to land management beyond 25 years, um, and they can only sell 25th, 77th of their original potential credits. But I don't want to use this example to scare or dissuade anyone from uh, doing compensatory mitigation in dynamic coast areas, because this is kind of also an example when you don't take climate change um, into account. Another example um, I wanted to use that I found was the, the Northwest Florida Water Management District in Luffy. So um, on the, ima uh, the image on the left, you should see uh, three red lines that kind of shows the amount of land or coastal erosion um, since I believe the early 1900s to about uh, 19, uh, 2016. So this restoration, but that did not dissuade them from doing restoration. So they are, uh, they have developed an adaptive management plan um, that takes climate change and the dynamic coastline into account. So um, despite this, they are pro still proposing salt marsh restoration as well as developing those breakwater oyster reefs that I briefly mentioned in the last slide. So dynamic environments require some flexibility in the way we think about durability. Uh, in the NOAA mitigation policy, we link durability to the goals of, of mitigation. So in some cases, this may be per, uh, permanent or in perpetuity, and in other times, it may be for a shorter length of time. So overall, there are a number of considerations related to mitigation in dynamic environments and climate change. Uh, they include how climate change will affect, um, how will affect the impact at site, what it means for the appropriate compensatory mitigation, and what are the needs of the landscape or seascape uh, now and as well into the future. So here, uh, NOAA has published you know, climate guidance for EFH and Endangered Species Program, as well as resources that can be found uh, through the USGS and Corps and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So with that, if you guys have any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kara. <laughs> Um, I do have a couple of questions from online. Uh, this is from Chris. Because in lieu fee projects are set up so that developers pay up front for impacts while the benefits come later when mitigation activities are complete, do in lieu fee projects offset the temporal loss inherent in the delay of benefits through the calculation of credits required? They should. 
And I believe under the 2008 rule, it's explicitly mentioned that temporal loss should be taken into account when um, calculating how much money needs to, um, what, what the fee needs to be. Calculating ahead of time how much it's going to cost to do a restoration project is really, really difficult. Um, so people of goodwill give it their best shot. Um, that doesn't always mean that they, they come in on right on the same dollar amount, but that's the idea. Any questions from the room? Any thoughts on incorporating climate change into things you're working on presently? Yes. Yeah, in Washington State, there's a mandate to remove culverts for fish passage, uh, salmon passage. And so on our latest advanced mitigation site, it's a estuary wetland stream restoration site. And there's obviously culverts upstream and downstream of our site. Um, I think there was three culverts downstream of our site before the creek entered the, the bay. Uh, so we did extensive hydrology modeling mm -hmm. with and what, without different scenarios mm -hmm. or culverts, mm -hmm. and then also planned our, our planting, so the plants that we were planting at different elevations based on salinity levels in the estuary. Oh, interesting. Um, did a lot of salinity monitoring before and after construction right. and before we planted. So that's different things to consider. Yeah. It's so extensive hydrology and salinity. Yeah, I, and you know, I hadn't, I, I hadn't thought about needing to, you know, take plant tolerance into account as well. Anyone else? Yeah, I can, I can hear the wheels turning, but. <laughs> One thing I want to mention with, with respect to this dynamic environments, um, one context in which this question came up from our regional staff is they were looking at needing to compensate for impacts to low marsh in a dynamic um, environment. And some of the people working on the project were saying, why should we do restoration of low marsh, even though the impact is low marsh, but in 30 years, that low marsh is going to be underwater. So let's do restoration in high marsh and then it will become low marsh in 30 years, which sounds good in theory until you remember that the species that need that low marsh now aren't just gonna sit around for 30 years and wait for it to become available. Um, so this is another situation where it's good to use a combination of approaches. So maybe you do restoration of low marsh and you either buy the land behind it so that that marsh has some place to migrate, or maybe you do some restoration of high marsh in conjunction with the low marsh restoration. It doesn't have to be an either or choice. Um, so that's kind of where we're, we're coming down is that it's, it's good to do things in combination. So is climate change a bad word in Canada? Our, our Canada guy is gonna answer that. <laughs> I'd love to hear how you guys are thinking about all this. Uh, not yet. Okay. <laughs> not yet a bad word. <laughs> not yet. A, it might change. Uh, who knows? Um, but you're, the wheels are, are turning. This is a bit of a bug bane of mine. And, and though I'm going to if I'm going to caveat and say, the horse left this barn a long time ago. Uh, at the same time, it always comes to mind when I hear it: adaptive management. Mm -hmm. So in science-based programs, as you know. Adaptive management means a very, very specific thing. I mean, almost invariably, what we're doing is not adaptive management. It's mm -hmm. monitoring and mitigation. But people can, can relate to and latch on to that term adaptive, especially in the context of climate change. And it, and it resonates, and then, you know, go for it. Mm -hmm. But I'm always reminded of that and struggle when I'm interacting with regulators, proponents, whomever, when they refer to adaptive management across the board. And it's like, mm -hmm. No, you're not doing that. Um, <laughs> you're doing more. As far as climate change goes, um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada is doing all kinds of things, and there's a, an awful lot of work that's happening. And uh, but I'm, you know, I, I suspect there's a, it's very similar to what you folks are doing as well. Uh, we probably go to the same meetings. It's an awful lot of collaboration, I would think. And in yeah. fact, I'm sure we're learning mostly from you folks. But certainly, we're um, we haven't had the, the struggles with with uh, as perhaps you've had up until perhaps you know in the recent. <laughs> past, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right. Well, this concludes our workshop on the NOAA mitigation policy and procedure. I want to thank you all for being the guinea pigs for this um, test run of it. We learned a lot. Um, we learned a lot from your questions. There's things we're definitely going to add into the next time we do this. And um, there are evaluation forms, and we would really appreciate it if you would fill them out. They won't take you very long. It's just a few short questions. And um, I hope to, again, there'll be a session on Wednesday on um, the landscape seascape approach and mitigation that will cover um, estuarine and marine um, mitigation as well. And there'll be a recap of the mitigation policy in case you forgot anything. Thank you very much.